Well, he was thought to be the smoking gun, his name used as part of the justification for the FISA warrants. But now that George Papadopoulos is speaking out, is he fizzling out as a big fish? And what about the people sent to offer him the goods? Were they potentially setting him up? These are some of the questions that are still out there with regard to his part of the story. What really happened? Chief National Correspondent Ed Henry in Washington with the story tonight. Martha, when George Papadopoulos first pled guilty to lying to the FBI last October, there were many in the mainstream media predicting this meant the walls were finally closing in on President Trump, one pundit after another declaring it was a bombshell. Last fall, the left kept pushing the narrative that the president was in deep trouble because Papadopoulos' interactions with an FBI informant and an alleged source for the unverified anti-Trump dossier might unlock the key to Trump campaign collusion with Russia to try and get dirt on Hillary Clinton. Except Trump loyalists kept insisting Papadopoulos was really just a glorified coffee boy who did not have a major role in the campaign, who appears to have been set up by a professor and FBI informant who flew him to London under the guise of paying Papadopoulos to write an academic paper, but then the professor asked leading questions about whether the advisor was tied to Russia. It turns out special counsel Robert Mueller's team came to believe that Papadopoulos lied to the FBI about that contact, not because he had colluded with Russia, but because he wanted to try and cover up that meeting in hopes he could still land a big job with the Trump team, which is why last week Mueller only gave Papadopoulos 14 days in jail. Yet some of the president's critics are still trying to keep alive the idea he has some kind of connection to Russia. Finding Russian operatives to meet with her president is that's kind of a diplomatic thing I would think yeah. is, is you're that saying your it, back, it sounds background? different than being the coffee boy that they're now describing him to be on the campaign yeah. I have no background at all in the US Russia relationship whatsoever actually when I was applying to work for the campaign I didn't express any you know real interest in Russia whatsoever right. I came from an energy uh, background you know I, all my business was actually done in the Middle East as you can see, Papadopoulos' real expertise was Egypt, not Russia. Yet last fall, when he pled guilty, CNN's Carl Bernstein declared that for the president, the Papadopoulos plea, coupled with other developments in Mueller's probe, suggested this scandal could be worse than Watergate. Mm. Martha? Thank you, Ed. Here now, Dan Bongino, host of The Dan Bongino Show and a former Secret Service agent under Presidents George W. Bush and Barack Obama. And he has been following this case uh, very closely, as anybody who listens to his show knows. Um, good to see you tonight, Dan. Thank you for being here. Um, so you, sure. you heard uh, what Ed reported in the setup piece. And, and one of the things that keeps striking me is, you know, who were these people who were sent to sort of tantalize George Papadopoulos and try to give him information. And what's really the basis of that? Listen to what he said here on The View about how he first came to meet uh, this professor. Watch. He invites me to the Andes Hotel by Liverpool Street mm -hmm. Station. The it's professor. A, the professor. It's a beautiful five-star hotel in London. He's like, let's get breakfast. I had no idea really what he wanted to talk about, except that he was <laughs> returning apparently from Russia. And um, I'm like, okay, let's meet. And then all of a sudden, he drops his bomb on me. And he's like, you know what, I just got back from Russia and I have all this information that the Russians have thousands of Hillary Clinton's emails. What does that sound like to you, Dan? Sounds to me that George Papadopoulos was part of not a collusion narrative with the Russians, but a setup, Martha. Mm. There are three key interactions here. Uh, George Papadopoulos is interaction with Mifsud, with Stefan yeah. Halper and with Alexander Downer. With specific regard to Mifsud, that clip you just played. What's fascinating about this is, are we interested any more about following the evidence or has partisan blinders made us just, uh, you know, put us in our boxes here? The evidence here is pretty clear that the Mifsud interaction is not what the media has made it out to be. In other words, an offer of genuine Russian emails. Why? Because Papadopoulos himself has told us multiple times, and no evidence has been produced to refute this, Martha, that there was no offer of emails, that that was simply a statement. However untoward it may have been about him having Russian emails, that's fine. But no offer, according to Papadopoulos, and no evidence has come up to the contrary, was apparently ever made at all. And one more thing on Mifsud, Martha. Mifsud's lawyer and his associates claim clear as day, repeatedly, that Mifsud's connections are also to Western intelligence agencies. Yeah. There's photos out there on the Internet to prove it. I wish people would look at the evidence and not conjecture. Well, it would be great if, you know, people who were investigating the whole situation would look into that as well. Um, because it just raises a lot of questions. You know, I, I listened to uh, several of these Papadopoulos interviews this morning. And just listening to everything that he says, the question that rises to, for me over and over is, 
Why? why? Why were these people suddenly popping into his life, right? I know he was on the list of foreign policy advisors, but suddenly there's a ton of interest in him, and everybody is, you know, sort of putting in front of him very tantalizing information to try to see, it, it feels like, if he would take the bait. Yeah, well, that's a fantastic question, and there's an answer for that. The answer is this. At that stage of the Trump campaign, we have to put ourselves back to where we were. A lot mm. of the uh, more elitist foreign policy, and I don't mean it in a bad way, but the elite foreign policy advisors were being scooped up by other campaigns who, sadly, at that time, had avoided the Trump campaign. That's just a matter of practical matter. He was interviewed at an editorial board, and Donald Trump took out a piece of paper saying, hey, right. these are my foreign policy guys. George Papadopoulos was not one of these elite guys. Um, and he was probably an easy target to set up precisely because he hadn't had this, this experience in the arena in the past. The setup narrative is very credible if you look at the evidence here, Martha. It's very suspicious, his interactions. All right. Uh, I do want to ask you a little bit about uh, what Don Jr., Donald Trump Jr., had to say about the fallout at the White House after this op-ed appeared from a disgruntled senior administration official. Um, he says the circle's getting very small of trust. Watch this. I think there are people in there that he can trust. It's just, it's a much smaller group than I would like it to be. Who do you trust? Well, I, you know, I'll keep that to myself. And they're not family? Well, obviously, yeah, I, I'm talking outside of family. Okay. I think that one goes without saying. What do you make of that? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's really sad that it's come to this. We have an elected, duly elected president of the United States. You're free to disagree with or not. Um, and he can't even get advice from an elite bunch of people uh, out there because they don't trust anyone. And this op-ed was just a cowardly, uh, really despicable act. You know, Martha, I don't speak with forked tongue on this. I'm not looking for anybody's applause line, but mm -hmm. I resigned my job as a Secret Service agent when I left uh, under the Barack Obama administration. It wasn't personal. I had no personal dislike for Barack Obama. I just felt like the country wasn't heading in a direction. Um, this person who wrote this op-ed should do the brave thing, not the cowardly thing, and then resign. Uh, but but I don't blame them for shortening up and tightening up their circle. It's clear they can't trust anyone. And it's clear the media is, uh, you know, more than apt to print this kind of stuff to make them look bad. They've been on the anti-Trump narrative for a long yeah. time. And before I let you go, Gary Cohn and Rob Porter both came out today with statements uh, basically saying that they loved working in the White House, that they felt that the portrayals of them in the Woodward book were misleading. Um, Obviously, you know, they're, they're in a difficult position. And, you know, the word is that the yeah. president is very unhappy with them. But you do have to ask yourself if, you know, all if this book has been created to, to push a certain narrative or did they, was he really open about everything that he was told? Well, some of the denials have been pretty forceful yeah. from others as well, including General Kelly, who is a well-respected man on both sides of the aisle. And Martha, having seen the first year of the White House and the Bush-Obama transition, I can tell you from having been there on the ground that chaos in the White House is not a hallmark of any one specific administration in the first year. It's a hallmark of all of them. Mm. I was there. Just ask any Secret Service agent. They'll <laughs> tell you. So I think the book has some issues. Dan, thank you. Great to see you tonight. Thanks for coming on. Dan Bongino. Yes, ma'am. No you problem. bet.